It was called the Roaring Twenties, and for good reason. The Great War had ended with the thought that it would be the last. Man had not just taken flight, but was crossing the Atlantic. Electricity was no longer a mystery, but a necessity that powered a wave of new inventions that changed the way we worked and lived. There's an awful lot of things on farms that could be done better with electric power. The railroad at that time was run on electric power. Hydroelectric dams fueled that change and were seen as the energy of the future. By the 1920s, hydropower provided one quarter of all the electricity in the United States. It was a time in which these technological advances created a sense that man could master the physical universe as well as Mother Nature. In the state of Washington, vast water resources made hydropower the answer to an economy that was fueled by a population in the 1920s that had more than doubled in two decades. Between 1882 and the 1920s, we can see this tandem growth between hydroelectricity and the electrical industry in the United States in terms of its consumption and development. To keep up with the growing demand for power, in 1917, Puget Sound Power and Light, a predecessor of today's Puget Sound Energy, announced plans to build a hydroelectric dam in the North Cascades. Blessed with abundant rainfall and glacial melt from Mount Baker, surveyors found the ideal site along the Baker River. One and a half miles north of where it pours into the Skagit River, Eden Canyon offered a narrow gorge that would minimize the dam's concrete structure. Nearby, the aptly named town of Concrete produced the dam's key ingredient, as well as having long established rail lines and roads that would speed construction. The dam's construction was hailed as a boon to the local economy. Dozens of new buildings soon materialized around the site, including offices, bunkhouses, mess halls, and employee cottages. With the addition of nearly 1,300 new workers to the area, the Concrete Herald likened it to the birth of a miniature town. They had dozens of saloons, they had several general stores, and of course, more than numerous brothels, which were very active during that time period. To supervise the massive project, William Shannon, an engineer with the parent company Stone & Webster, was tapped for the position. Shannon is one of these engineers of the early 20th century that develop reputations and expertise at moving things forward relentlessly. In the spring of 1924, work began 67 yards upstream of the gorge on a tunnel that would divert the Baker River around the construction site. Over the course of the construction, floods inundated the area, slowing progress and scattering equipment downstream. After a temporary coffer dam was built to shield the work site, the process of pouring the concrete base began. Baker Dam's arch design would curve upstream so that the massive force of the water behind it actually compresses and strengthens the structure as it pushes into the canyon walls. Day and night, over the course of 19 months, laborers bored tunnels, installed turbines, and strung over 122 miles of transmission lines to Cedro Woolley, Bellingham, Everett, and Seattle. In the fall of 1925, crews completed the last adjustments and the final system checks. Workers redirected the Baker River back to its original course, causing the water behind the dam to rise and spread. The newly formed Lake Shannon, named after the construction supervisor, would eventually stretch for seven miles to the northeast. On November 19th, water flowed through the intakes and spilled down the tunnel toward the turbine. The Concrete Herald reported, Unit 1 of the Baker Dam was now generating electricity. In November 1925, when the Lower Baker Dam first went online, it was a big doings in the community. It is celebrated in the press as the tallest dam in the nation completed ahead of schedule, which was quite amazing given that it was washed out by a flood the year before. The two units in the lower Baker Dam 
gave the plant the capacity to generate nearly 50 megawatts of electricity. For Puget Sound Power and Light, the dam was an enormous undertaking and represented an investment that would equal $125 million today. By the 1940s, the U.S. was embroiled in the Second World War. During the war, there was an increased demand for power. The defense industries had been growing, especially in the Pacific Northwest. Employment opportunities created a population boom, adding over one million new residents to the state from 1940 to 1960. To address the demand, they decided in the 50s that they needed to both put in a new unit to generate an extra 64,000 kilowatts of power, and they had plans to develop a new dam at Upper Baker. In June of 1956, work began to clear the site of the new Upper Baker Dam. In less than a year, workers had lowered the river by 28 feet. With a workforce hitting a peak of 1,200, the dam took shape as some 600,000 cubic yards of concrete were poured. By the fall of 1959, the straight concrete gravity dam was completed. Reaching a height of 312 feet, water backed up behind the dam, lifting the shoreline around Baker Lake by 60 feet and extending its length nine miles to the northeast. Built at a cost today of $221 million, the upper Baker Dam had the capacity to generate 98 megawatts of power. Today, the combined operating capacity of the upper and lower dams on the Baker River can provide 215 megawatts of electricity, enough to power up to 96,000 homes. Collectively, all of the dams within our state's borders generate 75% of our electricity and make Washington State the largest producer of hydroelectric power in the nation. But the damming of the state's waterways has come with a price. Its impact on the salmon's ability to travel from the rivers to Puget Sound and back again has taken a toll on their numbers. While the construction of the dams was an enormous engineering feat of its day, sustaining the salmon population continues to be an even greater challenge. <laughs>